slide. Just, you know. um, I'd like to begin also by acknowledging uh, that we're on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, pay my respect to their elders past, present and future, and also to say that this land was taken, it was taken by a legal fiction, it was taken violently and by force, and until we have reparations, until we have treaty, until we have recognition, until we pay for the hurts done to our first peoples, we won't be a whole nation. I also wanted to begin with uh, a little bit of housekeeping, which is more of a dis disclosures, I think, at random. Uh, Jeremy is a little bit sweaty, and uh, that, that's a sign of nervousness, but Jeremy had a sauna before he came here. And that's true, and that's why he's sweating. Um, and I, I have uh, naturally shaky hands, it's also a sign of nervousness, uh, but it's just a, it's a natural tremor. And uh, I think of those two things, having a sauna first is a lot weirder at this time of the morning. <laughs> so I think Jeremy loses on that one. Um, also, I don't know if you can see from where you are, these are just uh, disclosures I wanted to make before I get down to speaking. Uh, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of bald, but I woke up this morning and I have a, uh, like a, a, what seems like a pimple on my face, and, and so, I feel like um, in that liminal space that uh, like Drew Barrymore's in uh, Never Been Kissed, sort of possibly at high school, but also much older, <laughs> and a journalist. So that analogy actually works out a lot better than I was expecting when I started to say it. Um, I've not mentioned this before either, but um, whenever I'm talking in public, I become extremely conscious that I have lips. I get <laughs> and for just occurred to me then, I've, I, because I started thinking about them, and then, I, and then I realized I use them for eating and all sorts of things, <laughs> when they're totally incidental to me. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking about them now. I, I, so if I touch them, if I do anything like that, it's because I'm feeling very conscious about them being there. Thanks for coming. <laughs> glad, glad that we have that out of the way. Um, so I've, I've been asked uh, to, to, to speak on moments uh, this morning presumably because that's as much time as Jeremy gave me to prepare. Um, and, oh. Um, and I know you shouldn't start a speech by uh, implying that it's not gonna go well. I've done that now. I've also told you about my lips, so I think we're all in a safe place together. And we can just, uh, I, I should also say, sorry, this is the final piece of housekeeping. Um, it looks very much like that man is dead. Uh, it's, it's a Jürgen Teller picture of a man who is very much alive. He was sick at the time, he is well now, and so it was fine to draw a little stuff around his head. It's, it's like a halo, but it's also he's, he's getting well. Uh, and he perfectly illustrates those things that are hope and failure, which uh, obviously hope prevailed in this instance, good for him. Um, the speech is starting now, this is the proper bit, so it's, it's where, we, where we're at. For a long time I thought I was a cynic. This is, somewhat in color, in, this is somewhat encouraged in journalism. Cynicism has a seductive logic to it. It's a kind of ersatz wisdom, a shortcut to wisdom, ill-gotten and unquestioned, and in a world of bad news, more likely to be right than its more hopeful counterpart. For a long time I thought I was a cynic, and then I started a newspaper. And nothing will convince a person of their doe-eyed optimism like starting a newspaper in 2014. This was the first moment, a lunch in Sydney where I decided along with Maurice Schwartz that we'd launch, launch a newspaper together and that it would be called the Saturday paper. It turns out I want things to go well. I believe things will go well. I believe all sorts of difficult, unlikely things are possible. I place indecent faith in effort. I am, it turns out, an optimist. An optimism has a terrible reputation. There is not an aphorist alive or dead who has not done some cruelty to what I would argue is his most worthwhile of states, 
Oscar Wilde, Voltaire, Lucille Ball, Tom Hanks, all of the greats, <laughs> cross time, into Sully, have had a go. Uh, here's Oscar Wilde, for instance. If you pretend to be good, the world takes you very seriously. If you pretend to be bad, it doesn't. Such is the astounding stupidity of optimism. This isn't true, of course. If you pretend to be good, better if you are actually good, the world takes you seriously because the world desperately needs people who are good. It's much too easy to be bad. It's patently unhelpful to be bad. The seriousness with which we treat the good is the seriousness of hope. Part of the aspersions cast at optimism are that it is naive, that only an innocent could believe in the good of the world, that an optimist is like a kitten, agreeable and unprepared. At its worst, optimism is regarded as dumb hope. To be optimistic is to be idealistic, and we regard those who are idealistic as out of touch with reality. The word idealistic is almost exclusively pejorative, and yet its roots are not. Its origin is French and refers to the pursuit of the ideal as striving after the perfect state. Pursuit, striving, these, these are good things. They're not descriptions of idiot hope. They're an active quest for that which is better. But in newspapers, we're not just, oh, I got very close to, to being more like God for a bit, but uh, in newspapers, we're not just cynical about stories. There is that, though. We believe that if there is a chance to behave corruptly, people will behave corruptly, that if a crime might be committed, the worst scenario by which that crime could be understood is likely the right one. And yet, we're also cynical about our audiences. We're cynical about people. Confronted by an internet that stole their advertising, newspapers convinced themselves that unless they changed, the internet would steal their audiences too. And so they did something very odd. Without any indication that those audiences had altered, they decided that they had and that the news must alter to match them. Newspapers convinced themselves that their audiences were suddenly unserious, that their attention spans had winnowed to nothing, that they were not interested in the difficult but important, in stories about climate change, about refugees, about domestic violence, about policy. Newspapers would do these stories, of course, but they would keep them off their front pages. The last thing an editor wants to do is damage sales. The last thing he wants to do is overestimate his audience. I make these points because optimism is really about assumptions. And it is rare that you get the chance to test assumptions. Which is why, I think, I was asked to give this speech. Alternatively, Jeremy had another speaker, just hypothetically, <laughs> who pulled out very close to the event. <laughs> Three years ago, when we launched the Saturday paper, we did so to test the assumptions that were pervading newsrooms. Not just to see if assumptions could work, sorry, not just to see if optimism could work, but to see if newspapers could work. The starting point, if I was to pick one at random, is a line of H.L. Mencken's. No one ever went broke underestimating the intelligence of the American people. Probably, it's, it's a complex thought, so I'll say it more slowly. No one ever went broke underestimating the intelligence of the American people. The quote itself is paraphrased. The original is unwieldy, which is often the case with H.L. Mencken. If you notice, this, everyone sort of thinks that he's a, a, a gifted, um, curt humorist, but then you look at an H.L. Mencken quote, and it's like half a page of a book. It's, he does not have Oscar Wilde's brevity. Uh, the original quote, if I had just to go back to it, it, it refers not just to the American people, but to underestimating the intelligence of the great masses of the plain people. This, so far as I could tell, having spent my life in newsrooms, was the same safe bet journalism was making. And so I wondered if there was an alternative, a different assumption. What if newspapers refused to underestimate the seriousness of their readers? What if a newspaper staked itself its entire business model on their intelligence. These are difficult calls to make, especially for old newspapers. But for a young newspaper, and in particular an optimistic one, they can be a lot of fun. And the results are interesting. In almost every assumption, the opposite of what passes for conventional wisdom proved true. For the Saturday paper, the longer a story is, the better it performs online. The more serious an issue is, and the more complex its presentation, the better it is received. If you put difficult but important topics on page one, climate change, refugees, policy, the more copies you'll sell, the more people want to read, to know, to be informed. Every issue of the paper, the paper most people said was a madness, has broken even or turned a profit from day one. I make these points 
as a small part of a larger point about optimism. The Saturday paper could easily have failed. A cynic would have said that failure was its only certainty. But it took a risk on audience. It took a risk on society. It assumed people were different to the way in which we too often perceive them to be, to the way we are told that they are. It assumed very simply that people are good. And that risk, the risk of hope, of optimism, is the only way we will solve the problems of the world in which we live. Cynicism is the state of answering without thinking. I thought of that line last night when I was writing this. I was like, that's really good. <laughs> Thank you, H.L. Mencken. Cynicism is the state of answering without thinking. Optimism, though, is the state of acting without hesitation. Such a neat inversion. <laughs> we live in a world without the time for hesitation. We live in a world only optimism will save. About 80% of people are said to suffer from an optimism bias. Suffer is a strange word here, but it's the word that we are told by clinicians to use. Research suggests that all brains respond in the same way to good news, but the brains of optimists do not respond to bad news. MRIs show the frontal lobe blocking it out. Electromagnetic pulses can change this briefly, but like belief systems, being told you have an optimism bias does not damage that bias. It doesn't change it. Now a segue. Not the machine, an artistic device. Uh, if, <laughs> if, I, if I had another slide, I would definitely, or knew how to use these, it's just my thumb, it doesn't even work. Uh, that's when you would get one. Like, let's talk about films. Is it gl Click, the one where Adam Sandler has like a special, anyway. It'd be remiss of me in talking about optimism not to also mention failure. For me, optimism and failure, or a fear of failure, live in a strange symbiosis. Optimism is a kind of ambition, I think. If we define it that way, we're more willing to identify its usefulness. And failure and ambition are inextricably linked. They depend on one another. Each needs the threat of its alternative. Here comes another neat inversion from last night. Ambition without failure is fantasy. Failure without ambition is stasis. Think about it. <laughs> Sorry, it's more for me. Uh, but <laughs> thanks for being here, everyone. Uh, fear of failure is the thing that has most defined my life. It's plotted the course of my career. It's the grist of most of the decisions I've made. I became a journalist because I had thought I'd failed to get into university, which I presume looking at journalism is what happened to most people. Uh, but in those weeks after school finished, waiting for results, I became increasingly convinced I'd failed. When the Sydney Morning Herald asked if I would like a job with them, I jumped at it and forgot about university entirely, and I've been terrified of failure ever since. Every optimistic decision I've made has been about trying to stay in front of failure to somehow outrun it. Another moment. A little tie back to the theme. Another moment. Uh, the morning of my 25th birthday, the film producer Margaret Fink telephoned. We were keeping the newspaper a secret at the time, and I had not been publishing work. Uh, she spoke down the line in her dry, lived, eight-year-old voice, which I will approximate, but believe me, not do justice to. If you haven't done something by the time you're 25, lovey, you never fucking will. <laughs> the strange thing about being young is always worrying that you will run out of time. You learn that this is a nonsense, but you do so only in hindsight. Back to failure. We're living through a vogue for failure. Neil Gaiman wants us to celebrate it. The philosopher Daniel Dennett talks about making good mistakes. Opinion pages are clogged with peons to disappointment. Books are published with subtitles like Why Failing Well is the Key to Success or Creativity and the Gift of Failure. None of this I believe. And it's worthy here to draw a distinction. Some failure cuts down brilliance. It is ruinous and cruel but most failure corrects folly. A fear of both kinds is sensible, I would argue. They correct each other. I was flying back from Tasmania a little while ago reading a book of Richard Flanagan's essays called And What Do You Do, Mr. Gable? The collection takes its name from a conversation, likely apocryphal, between William Faulkner and Clark Gable, in which the actor apparently asked Faulkner what he did for a living. I write, Faulkner is said to have responded, and what do you do, Mr. Gable? As a funnier joke when Clark Gable was famous. Uh, it's really, 
the returns on that are diminishing. <laughs> he was an actor. <laughs> History does not record how he responded. I was reading in the book an essay Richard wrote after he directed the film of his second novel, The Sound of One Hand Clapping. The essay is really about the struggle between novels and film, the fight between them for primacy in a culture that is disappointed by the limits of each. Flanagan struggles with the act of making a film, the cyclone willed into existence in the eye of which the director is forced to live. Poetic. Not something I like. Um, <laughs> Newspapers are a little like that, a weekly maelstrom always slightly beyond control at their most chaotic just before the landfall of deadline. In the end, Richard decides he's a writer. As an essayist, Flanagan is a writer of quotation. He has in his mind a great library of aphorisms and written truths. Reading him, I realized that while his film was a success, this was also an essay about failure. He quoted Carlos Fuentes to this end. We cannot act without the horizon of failure constantly in view. For those uh, who, over that, the hum of that motorcycle, didn't hear the end of that uh, great wisdom, we cannot act without the horizon of failure constantly in view. Large projects are menaced by failures, films and novels and newspapers. In all extinctions, the biggest animals die first. I was having lunch with Richard earlier that day of cider and Aperol spritzes and finally beer. We were talking about a book I had just handed in to my publisher, about the anxiety that lives between finishing a book and seeing it on shelves. That anxiety is failure. Richard told me he thought his first novel, Death of a River Guide, had fallen stillborn from the presses. This feeling persisted for several months after it reached stores. It is now available in more languages than most people could count, let alone speak. I think I'd like to finish this as Richard finished his essay. He chose from that storehouse of remembered wisdoms a line from the poet Robert Browning. A man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? That's the truth of optimism. We should all fear failure, know it even, but we should not let it dampen our willingness to make things, to take risks, to hope, to reach beyond the safety of our grasp. A final moment. One night, after sending edition, I was having a drink with my proprietor, Maury Schwartz. Out of nowhere, he told me that you should not call yourself a businessman until you've been bankrupt once. An optimist, he's lost everything twice. <laughs> Thanks.